Hello and welcome back to the Biochemistry for Health Sciences channel. Today we shall discuss protein catabolism. As we mentioned in the last video, the breakdown of proteins become a very important metabolic pathway during late starvation. Recall from the previous videos that we emphasize how important it is to maintain our blood glucose concentration at least greater than 40, 50 milligrams per deciliter. And this is very important because the brain and the red blood cells can only use glucose for their energy needs. So this is a very important thing that we have to do, that your body has to do, irrespective of what metabolic state you are in. So during the early stages of starvation, liver glycogenolysis is the predominant pathway that maintains our blood glucose. However, after about one day, all the liver glycogen will be depleted and now Gluconeogenesis, liver gluconeogenesis, is the only metabolic pathway that can maintain our blood glucose. As we discussed in the last few videos, the process of gluconeogenesis, that is synthesis of new glucose, requires energy and building blocks. Energy is not a problem because we can get a lot of energy from fatty acids, which come from the breakdown of triglycerides in adipocytes. However, what is a problem for gluconeogenesis is building blocks. So early on in late starvation, we, get, we can use pyruvate, we can use lactate, we can use glycerol for making glucose. However, later in starvation, as the body relies more and more on gluconeogenesis to maintain blood glucose, these building blocks are not sufficient. We need more building blocks. So where does this additional building block come from to make glucose that is so important for the brain and the red blood cells? And the answer is amino acids. So now, besides lactate, py pyruvate, and glycerol, amino acids will be the source of the additional building blocks that the body needs to make glucose. As you know, amino acids come from proteins, and we find proteins everywhere in the body. Since proteins carry out a lot of very important functions for the cell, we don't simply want to start breaking proteins down everywhere in the body. There is a lot of protein in the skeletal muscles since skeletal muscles make up almost half of your body weight. So that's what the body does. It will break down the proteins in the skeletal muscles to give amino acids and then these amino acids can be used by the liver or the kidneys or the GI tract to make glucose via gluconeogenesis. During starvation, there is decreased insulin, increased glucagon, as well as increased glucocorticoids such as cortisol and all of these conditions will promote proteolysis in the skeletal muscles, giving us peptides as well as amino acids. So the focus of this video is to try to answer this question, how are proteins broken down in muscles during starvation? There are two major systems for breaking proteins down. One is called the ubiquitin proteasome system or UPS. This is responsible for breaking down almost 80% of the proteins. And this system degrades individual ubiquinated proteins. The second system for breaking down proteins is the lysosomal autophagic pathways. 
This system is responsible for about 20% muscle protein breakdown and it breaks down large amounts of proteins including other biomolecules such as lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, as well as parts of uh, cytoplasm and even whole organelles. Let's first look at the ubiquitin proteasome system. UPS is not only important for starvation, this is, a also, this is also a very important system for breaking down proteins during cell cycle progression, gene transcription, as well as growth. Here are the major components of this system. The first is this protein called ubiquitin. This is a relatively small protein with 76 amino acids. The end terminal of this protein has a methionine. The C terminal is flexible and ends with a glycine. Ubiquitin has seven lysine residues. Remember lysine is a basic amino acid it has an additional amine, giving it a positive charge. And the one letter abbreviation for this lysine is K. The other components of this system are some enzymes, E1, E2, as well as E3. And the last component is a proteasome this is a very huge cytoplasmic 26S protein that contains as many as 30 polypeptide chains. The proteasome consists of a 20S cylindrical core as well as two caps. Each cap is 19S, so there's a cap on the top here, and there's a cap at the bottom of the cylindrical core. Let's see how the UPS breaks down muscle proteins. In the first step, the UPS requires the help of enzymes, other enzymes such as caspases, to break down the myo filaments such as your actin myosin filaments into smaller protein fragments and once we have these smaller protein fragments then the UPS can break these protein fragments into peptides. Let's see how the ubiquitin proteasome system the UPS breaks protein fragments into peptides. Here's the basic concept of the ubiquitin proteasome system. So first of all, the target protein, so this is the target protein. This protein has to be attached to at least one, two, three, four, at least four, minimum of four ubiquitins, four ubiquitins. And these ubiquitins have to be connected to one another through their lysine 48. So this ubiquitin structure here has a certain shape. It has a certain shape. Okay, so basically we have a certain shape of ubiquitin that is attached to the target protein. So the target protein with this polyubiquitin chain is what is recognized by the proteasome. Okay, and we shall see that in a few minutes. The proteasome recognizes this structure here and that will now bring this target protein to the proteasome and once it gets into the proteasome we will see that this target protein will be broken down into smaller peptides. So that is the concept by which UPS works. 
the idea is to take any protein that we want to break down by this proteasome. We want to attach at least four ubiquitins to a certain linkage. And that in this case is K48. Sometimes K11 is, can also be degraded by the proteasome, but K48 has been found to be the most popular linkage where the proteasome prefers to degrade the target protein. So let's look at these two parts. Uh, the first part is how a ubiquitin is attached to the target protein and then how subsequent ubiquitins are added to the first ubiquitin. And in the second part, we'll see how this structure binds the proteasome and eventually the target protein is broken down into peptides. So these are the two parts we shall see, one and two. The first step is to make the carboxyl group of the ubiquitin reactive. So we want to make the ubiquitin reactive. And how is this done? The terminal carboxyl group, which belongs to glycine in ubiquitin, reacts with ATP. And now we have an AMP attached to the carboxyl group. PPI is released and this drives the reaction forward. In the next step, the enzyme E1, which has an active cysteine sulfhydryl here, this sulfhydryl will attack this carbonyl that will cause the ubiquitin to be attached to the E1 through a thioester. So you can see a thioester will attach the ubiquitin to the enzyme E1 and AMP is released. So now ubiquitin has a reactive thioester rather than a carboxyl, which is not reactive. In the next step, another enzyme E2 that has a reactive sulfhydryl, this will now attack the carbonyl and that will cause the transfer of the ubiquitin to E2 and E1 is released in a sulfhydryl form, E1 is released. So now we have ubiquitin that is attached to enzyme E2. So basically the ubiquitin from enzyme E1 reacts with enzyme E2, enzyme E1 is released, and the ubiquitin now is attached to enzyme E2. So why do we transfer the ubiquitin from E1 to E2? Because E2 is the enzyme that can be recognized by the next step, which is your E3. Okay, so E3 can recognize E2. And E2 has also been reported to play many other roles. For example, in regulating the type of ubiquitin ubiquitin that is attached to one another, what kind of shape that will be formed that may be also regulated by enzyme E2. The next step is catalyzed by enzyme E3. So in humans, uh, we may have two different types of E1, about 30 different types of E2, but E3, we have almost 500 different types of E3. So E3 is the protein that will, the enzyme that will attach the ubiquitin and the target protein together. Okay, so E3 is the enzyme that will do this connection between the target protein and the ubiquitin. How this is done depends on the type of E3. So for example, it is one type of E3 where the target protein will bind the E2 with the ubiquitin will bind, and when the two are bound, the amine of the target protein will attack this thioester, and that will cause the ubiquitin to be transferred to the target protein. 
in another class of E3, the E3 active site cysteine will react with the E2 with its ubiquitin. The ubiquitin will now be transferred to E3, releasing the E2 as its sulfhydryl cysteine. And the next step, the ubiquitin that's attached to E3 will now react with the target protein, and that gives you the target protein that is ubiquinated and releasing the E3 in its acid form. So once the first ubiquitin is attached to the uh, target protein, the, that reaction could stop here, or the cell could keep on adding more ubiquitins to the first ubiquitin. The addition of more ubiquitins is catalyzed by the enzyme ubiquitin, ubiquitin ligase E4, which also belongs to the E3 ligase family. So we'll just denote this enzyme as E3-4. The carboxyl group of this ubiquitin could react with any of the amines present in this ubiquitin that's attached to the protein, for example, the N-terminal amine or the amine present in lysine 6 or lysine 11, 27, 29, 33, 48, or 63. So this different combinations will give us ubiquitin that is attached in many different shapes. Okay, so we have this polyubiquitin chain of various shapes that can be formed. As we mentioned earlier, for the target protein to be degraded by the proteasome, we must have at least four ubiquitin monomers added to the target protein. And these monomers have to be attached via their lysine 48 or to a small extent via their lysine 11. The other polyubiquitin shapes can do different things in the cell. For example, if there's one ubiquitin attached to the target protein that could be involved in endocytosis as well as DNA repair, um, ubiquitin chains that are attached to lysine 63 to the target protein, they are involved in what we'll talk about in the next section, lysosomal fusion autophagic pathway destruction of proteins by lysosomes, or they could be involved in ribosome function as well as DNA repair. And then we have this branch chain, ubiquitin branch chain, and that could be involved in cell signaling. So the different shapes that is present on the target protein can cause the target protein to do various things. Now it should be noted that we have these enzymes here called the ubiquinating enzymes. And these enzymes can remove one or more ubiquitins from the chain at any time in this process. Okay, so that's the first part, uh, attaching the ubiquitin to the target protein. So that was the first part. Now let's talk about the second part how is this target protein destroyed by the proteasome? So in the first step, the uh, cap of the proteasome will recognize the ubiquitin. So it recognizes this ubiquitin that is present on the ubiquinated protein and it will bind the cap. So the cap and the target protein is now bound to one another. Notice that before the binding happened, there is this gate here on the core, on the cylindrical core, the cylindrical core of the proteasome, and this gate right now is closed. However, after the binding, this gate is now open. Okay, so the binding of the target protein to the cap causes a conformational change in the 20S core, and that causes the gate to be open. In the next step, the 
unfolded flexible end or the tail of the target protein gets inserted into the ATPase ring of the cap. The ATPase ring, ATPase ring of the cap now will pull this protein downwards into the pore of the core. Now as the protein is pulled through the gate, there is a protease subunit present in the cap and this enzyme will remove the ubiquitin from the target protein. So the rest of the protein substrate now becomes unfolded by the cap and the unfolded protein is now traded deep into the cavity of the proteasome. The core of a proteasome is actually an enzyme. There's an enzyme part. It's a threonine protease with six active sites. And this enzyme basically hydrolyzes or breaks down the protein, the target protein, into smaller peptides of about 3 to 23 amino acids long. This 3 to 23 amino acid long peptides will come out of the proteasome and then there are other proteases present in the cell that will break down these peptides into amino acids. So this is how the target protein in the cell is broken into amino acids by the ubiquitin proteasome system. Now let's discuss the autophagic pathways. If the protein has um, ubiquitin, four more ubiquitin attached to one another via K48 or K11, then the protein will be degraded by the proteasome using the ubiquitin proteasome system. However, if the protein has shorter ubiquitin chains attached via K63, lysine 63, then the protein will be degraded by the lysosome. There are three types of lysosomal autophagic pathways. One is macroautophagy. That's the major form. We usually just call this autophagy. The second is chaperone-mediated autophagy. And the third is microautophagy. In all these cases, the objective is to send the protein, the cellular cargo to be destroyed to the lysosome where the actual destruction is going to happen. Let's first look at uh, macro autophagy, or just simply we can call this uh, autophagy. This is the major form of the lysosomal autophagic pathway. First, an overview. Uh, this pathway is activated after about 24 hours starvation. There is a double membrane vesicle form. This vesicle is called autophagosome. And to form this membrane, we require lipids such as phosphatidylacnolamine, as well as proteins that are encoded by the autophagy related genes these ATG proteins. Essentially what happens in this pathway is that first an autophagosome is formed. So we have to form an autophagosome and then the autophagosome will engulf the protein cargo that needs to be destroyed or degraded. And after that the autophagosome will fuse with the lysosome and after fusion, the protein cargo in the lysosome will be destroyed into amino acids. Autophagy is inhibited by the amino acids uh, leucine and phenylalanine, as well as a few other amino acids. But leucine and phenylalanine are very strong inhibitors of autophagy. So let's now look at the various steps of this pathway called macroautophagy or simply autophagy. So during starvation, of course, there's decreased energy. A lot of ATP has been used up. 
uh, that ATP has been converted either to ADP or AMP. There is a low amount of glucose. So all of this basically means the cell has low energy and this low energy will stimulate a protein called AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. This protein is basically an energy sensor. Okay, so when energy is low in the cell, this protein will be activated. And that's what happens in starvation. Of course, the reverse, when the cell is rich in energy, that is going to inhibit AMPK. Now, once AMPK is stimulated, it will go and stimulate or activate a very important protein complex called ULK1 complex. ULK1 stands for UNC51 like kinase 1. So ULK1 complex, which is made up of a few proteins such as ULK1, ATG13, RB1CC1, this complex will be activated or stimulated by AMPK, which in turn will be stimulated by low energy that we see during starvation. This ULK complex is very strongly inhibited by this protein mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR. However, the activated AMPK that we see during starvation, this will inhibit mTOR. And by this inhibition, that inhibition by mTOR of ULK1 is removed. ULK1 now becomes very active and it will now initiate autophagy. In the next step, the activated ULK1 complex will now activate a PI3K complex, class 3 phosphatidyl inositide 3 kinase complex. And this complex is made up of a number of various proteins. Uh, for example, VPS34 that has the PI3K kinase activity. There's VPS15, there's Beclin1 that's involved in regulation of this complex as well as other proteins such as ATG14L. So the PI3K activity of this complex will now add phosphates onto the hydroxyl groups of phosphatidyl inositol that is present on membranes such as the ER membrane. So a little part of the ER membrane will start getting phosphorylated and of course, phosphates are negatively charged. So this will make that part of the ER membrane highly negatively charged. And this negatively charged membrane is going to attract several autophagic proteins. One of these proteins that it gets attracted is the WIPI proteins. And these proteins are going to induce a curvature of the ER membrane in this region. So we see this membrane becoming curved and eventually breaking away, splitting away from the ER to form what we call an isolation membrane. Isolation membrane. Also called a FAGO4, isolation membrane or FAGO4. The other proteins that are attracted to the membrane uh, include, including uh, uh, ATG12, 5, and 16. They work very similar to the uh, ubiquitin proteasome system. So they basically act as UB, ubiquitin, as E1, as E2, and E3. And using this similar mechanism, they end up forming a 12-5-16 complex on the FAGA4. So now the FAGA4 has this very important 
16 complex that is formed. In the next step, other ATG proteins, such as ATG8 and ATG4, will help form an LC3PE complex. Uh, LC3 is microtubule associated protein light chain 3 or LC3. And this LC3PE is phosphatidyl ethnolamine, the lipid phosphatidyl ethnolamine. So this LC3 PE complex is recruited to the figure four. And that is done by the help of this 12516 complex that has been formed on the figure four in the previous reaction. So the addition of more phosphatidyl ethnolamine lipid will help elongate the figure four. Okay, so this figure four becomes longer and longer by the addition of more lipids. As the figure four elongates, there is another set of proteins called cargo recognition proteins. And these cargo recognition proteins, they can bind ubiquitin as well as LC32. And by binding ubiquinated proteins as well as LC32, they help the attachment of the target protein to the figure four. So this target protein is connected to the figure four LC3 by the cargo binding or cargo recognition proteins. So in this way, the FAGO4 keeps on expanding, elongating, and more and more of these uh, target proteins get uh, connected to the FAGO4. Eventually, the FAGO4 will close and form a vesicle, which is called autophagosome. In the next step, we have these motor proteins that basically these motor proteins such as kinesins and dynein, dynectin, these motor proteins will carry the autophagosome as well as the lysosome. And they will basically walk on these microtubules, these microtubules basically like little roads in the cell. And these motor proteins will carry these vesicles and walk towards one another so that the lysosome can become attached to the phagosome. So there are many, many proteins that are involved in uh, attachment of the uh, lysosome to the phagosome. And eventually once they are attached, they are fused. The two vesicles are fused. And with the help of proteins such as snare and, and many, many proteins, this fusion occurs, the inner membrane of the autophagosome breaks, and now we have the cargo, the cargo protein in the lysosome, and all the lysosomal enzymes present in the lysosome, especially various proteases, will break down this protein, this cargo protein, into amino acids. So this is a summary of uh, macro autophagy. So basically we have initiation or nucleation to form the phago 4 and then elongation of the phago 4 and then the target protein is bound to the phago 4 and then the phago 4 is close to form the autophagosome and now the autophagosome and the lysosome will travel towards one another with the help of these motor proteins. Eventually these two vesicles will get attached, they will fuse. So there's attachment and fusion of autophagosome to lysosome. And now all the contents of the autophagosome are in the lysosome and the target protein is broken down into amino acids. So this is how another way by which muscle proteins can be broken down into amino acids. 
A few words about Chapron Mediated Autophagy or CMA. So in this case, the target protein is recognized by special proteins called chaperons, co-chaperons. So basically this chaperon, co-chaperon will recognize and bind to the target protein. So the chaperons, co-chaperons will bind the target protein by recognizing special sequences on the target protein. So the, there are short sequences of motifs present in the target protein that are recognized by these uh, chaperons, co-chaperon proteins. These sequences typically have a Q or glutamine at one end or the other end, and then the rest of the amino acids in a sequence will include basic amino acids, acidic amino acids, as well as hydrophobic amino acids. So one example of a sequence here would be lysine, the basic amino acid, phenylalanine, the hydrophobic amino acid, glutamic acid would be the acidic amino acid, arginine, the basic amino acid, and ending with a Q or glutamine. That's a KFERQ sequence. And these are the type of sequences that be, will be recognized by the chaperon, co-chaperon proteins. So after recognition, the target protein will now be bound by the chaperon, co-chaperon. In the next step, the target protein bound with the chaperon, co-chaperon will recognize a receptor on the lysosome. And this receptor here is the lysosomal receptor, lysosome associated membrane protein 2A or LAMP2A. So now we have the binding of the chaperon, co-chaperon target protein to LAMP2A on the lysosome. After this binding has occurred, the target protein is unfolded. So it's unfolded and it will enter the lysosome. And once the target protein enters the lysosome, several different proteases present in the lysosome will break the, pro the target protein down into amino acids. The chaperon, co-chaperon will be released and be ready to bind another target protein. Now a few words on microautophagy. This is a very simple process where the lysosomal membrane will invaginate close to the cargo and the next step would be the engulfment of the cargo and then subsequent breakdown of the cargo protein into amino acids in the lysosome. So there we have it. This is how muscle proteins are broken down into the 20 different amino acids that make up proteins. And out of these 20 amino acids, we'll see in the next video, 18 out of the 20 amino acids can be used by organs such as your liver, your kidneys, and the GI tract, the intestine, uh, to make glucose by gluconeogenesis. Okay, so 18 of these 20 amino acids can provide the building blocks for gluconeogenesis by the liver, uh, kidneys, or the intestine. And that's what we will discuss in the next video. So until then, once again, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye and have a wonderful day.